Hello and welcome to your voiceover on pancreas and gallbladder disorders. I know you're super excited. Um, hopefully you are coming here after the liver disorder lecture. Makes a little bit more sense. But if you are not, um, we'll get you through it. Um, our first disorder, we're just going straight into uh, a couple of disorders here. Um, this is going to be disorders or problems with the gallbladder. Um, the gallbladder is really just a storage stop. There is really no other purpose for it other than it stores bile. Um, bile is made in the liver and then it is stored here for later use. Some of it dribbles down into the intestine and gets used, taking bilirubin with it, um, which we discussed in the liver lecture. But bile is made in the liver and any bile that is not needed gets stored in the, um, in the gallbladder. So um, increased levels of cholesterol causes cholesterol. So the, the, a lot of the problem here comes from increased cholesterol levels because then um, the liver makes cholesterol as well. And then if you have a lot of circulating cholesterol, there's kind of just an excess of cholesterol laying around. So what happens is not only bile is coming out and getting stored in here, but now we've got um, cholesterol as well. And that kind of, you know, cholesterol just blocks up everything. So um, it's called biliary sludge when cholesterol and bile kind of all get together. And so all this sludgy area here um, is kind of congested and um, that area kind of hardens up into stones. It's very similar to, um, you know, the hard water in our pipes that if there is, if you use a water softener, your pipes don't get congested with crud. Um, whereas if you don't use a water softener, all the calcium and all the the crystals and things that are in our hard water um, kind of sludge up on our pipes, which is exactly what's happening in the way to the gallbladder is bile and cholesterol combine around. And anyway, that hardens up into stones. Bile itself shouldn't har harden into stones, but when you add bile and cholesterol together, they do harden up into stones. Um, so just having stones um, is not that big of a deal. You have a couple of them sitting in there, no big deal. They just stay in the storage area. The problem is, is when, um, you know, stones get stuck in certain areas, then we have problems with backup. Um, so if we have a stone stuck here, now bile trying to get out of the kidney gets stuck. I mean, get out of the kidney, get out of the liver. Um, bile gets stuck and starts to accumulate because the liver is still continuing to make bile, but now the bile is stuck in the liver. The other problem that we have is that maybe a stone will get stuck down in here and now we have problems with um, all these digestive enzymes getting stuck behind the stone and also bile getting stuck in the bladder because there's an obstruction right here. So you can see wherever these stones um, end up could be causing more than there are some worsening conditions that they will cause. Most people just have a stone kind of stuck in the neck of the gallbladder or halfway down um, and it causes quite a bit of pain. So let's look at our um, first cue really is pain. Pain is going to be our big problem when we have um, a stone stuck in the bile duct. Um, it is called biliary colic. It's intermittent pain. It will be in the right upper quadrant because this is really sitting below the liver. Liver sits in the right upper quadrant. It sits kind of underneath the liver. So it's right upper quadrant pain, radiates up to the right shoulder and to the back. Um, it is intermittent pain. Again, as that bile tries to squish past it, it creates spasms of the biliary duct um, and causes quite a bit of pain. Worse one to three hours after eating because that's when the liver is trying to produce more bile and get it out of the system um, and when the digestive enzymes are getting produced. So the pain is always worse after eating, um, a low-grade fever due to inflammation, and fatty diarrhea. Um, if we take a look at this picture again, um, if you were at the bile lecture, uh, and I said the bile lecture, the liver lecture, um, you'll know that one of bile's jobs is to break up fat. So if we have a reduction in the flow to the intestine, then fats just kind of move through the intestine and don't get digested. Um, so the first cues, again, are going to be pain because this area is trying to spasm out that stone. But then um, 
as bile kind of backs up and can't get into the intestine, you have some fatty diarrhea because the fats are just kind of sliding on through. Um, they haven't been digested anywhere. And this will get worse because bile production will increase after you eat and intestinal enzyme production will decrease, will increase after you eat. So hopefully you go in when you have pain and you um, get this taken care of. You get your gallstones taken care of, which we'll talk about in a second. Worsening cues is liver injury or pancreatitis, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Acute liver injury we talked about back in the um, liver lecture. And that is just because of the backup areas. Um, bile is a digestive enzyme. So if enough of it backs up into the kidney, it can cause liver damage um, to the liver cells. And if the occlusion is down at the very bottom, that common pancreatic bile duct, um, let me draw another little picture here. So we have our beautiful liver and um, we have our pancreas here. This is map not drawn to scale here. This is the liver and this is the pancreas. And then we have our um, gallbladder, which I like to draw in green because bile is kind of greenish colored. So here's our gallbladder. And here is the um, the ducts. So we can see here, and then that all dumps out into the um, intestines. So this is the duodenum. It all dumps out into the duodenum down there. So what the pancreas is doing, and we'll talk about that in just a second, the pancreas is um, creating enzymes, and so they're dumping into the duodenum. The liver is creating bile to dump into the duodenum. But if you have a stone right here at the bottom blocking all of that, we have problems with pancreatic digestive enzymes and bile not able to get out into the um, intestine. And so all that will back up and cause damage because these are bile and pancreatic enzymes, our liver enzymes, that if we back up those things into the organs, then they cause damage. Um, so... We will take that from there. Key assessments are going to be pain level and location, and then the markers for liver and pancreas enzymes. And so when we talk about pancreatitis, you will see that if our amylase and lipase are going up, we have pancreatic damage. If our AST and ALT are going up, we're having liver damage. So we will look for the worsening cues based on the labs that we see. Um, Mostly pain, though, is going to tell us that we do have a problem or stones in our bile duct. So what do you do for gallbladder? Um, if you just have it and it's not causing liver damage um, or pancreas damage, then you'll get antibiotics, some IV fluid, pain control, and they remove your gallbladder. You can also do cholesterol lowering your medications because that will reduce the sludge. So if you get some antibiotics, pain control, a little bolus of fluid, and statins control the pain, then you are good to go. They'll probably just follow your um, gallbladder to see if there are any further problems. If you have another episode of gallstones or any evidence of liver or kidney or pancreas damage, then they will remove the gallbladder. So if you just have multiple, multiple stone episodes um, or you have a really bad stone episode, they're going to go in and take your gallbladder out. Um, so of course, increased cholesterol. So keeping your cholesterols under control will reduce your risk of gallbladder disorder. Um, if you have liver disease, um, high estrogen levels, anything that is causing increased um, increased production of cholesterol, then you could have an increased risk of gallbladder stones. Um, so of course, necessarily, you're going to have a low-fat diet. Um, either you have stones that are immediately blocking um, and bile can't get through to digest the fats, or after you've had your gallbladder removed, um, now you don't have a storage place for bile. So the only bile that gets into the intestine is kind of, it dribbles in slowly over time. Normally what we have is, let me draw your, your picture again. Oh, undo. I didn't want to draw that yet. You have your, um, your liver here that's constantly making it, it makes bile like pee. Um, and we have our pancreas. Well, we don't need to worry about the pancreas. Um, we're just drawing the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is sitting here, and you've got that going down to your intestines there. Um, so if you have a gallbladder, 
extra um, bile that is not being used will just get stored in the gallbladder. And then when you eat your um, pizza, then it squirts out a whole lot of um, bile into the intestines. So you get like tons of bile into the intestines after a pizza. Um, if they have removed your gallbladder, so your gallbladder is gone, then all that is dribbling, there's no storage. And so you just dribble little bits of bile in and you cannot handle um, a huge fatty meal because you just don't have enough bile to digest all that fat. So after you've had a gallbladder surgery, you still produce bile. It's made in the liver, but you're just producing it in small, small, smaller amounts. And so you can't handle a big fatty meal. But really, losing your gallbladder doesn't affect anything other than your ability to eat high fat, which we're probably telling people not to do anyway. Um, so having gallstones means you're going to get some antibiotics, some fluids, and pain control. And as long as there is no liver or pancreas damage, then they'll probably let them pass. If you're having multiple stone episodes um, or you're having any kind of liver or pancreas damage, then you will get your gallbladder removed. So any worsening cues will get you to remove a gallbladder or frequent episodes of gallstones. So we're going to talk about the pancreas now. We talked about the liver and all of its things in the last um, lecture. And we're going to talk a little bit about the pancreas. Um, so our beautiful drawing here shows us um, exactly what the, uh, the pancreas is doing here. Um, it has two functions. And one of its big functions is to make all of our um, digestive enzymes. And those are made um, right here in these sacs. There's a bunch of these little digestive making sacs here. And then they will go out and dump into the intestine after every meal. So these are not being made all day long like bile is. Um, these are just being made with a meal. They're kind of stored in there. And then they squirt out with your meal. And then they all end up in the duodenum. And so as food drops in there, the digestive enzymes start attacking the food. So we make um, trypsin, amylase, and lipase. Um, we measure. We can measure amylase and lipase in our bloodstream. It shouldn't be in our bloodstream. It's supposed to be in our intestines. Um, this is pretty vascularized, though. And so if there is a blockage, so let's talk about if there is a blockage here to our digestive enzymes getting out and they start to back up into our space because remember as soon as you eat as soon as you put something in your mouth you start stimulating these boys to make their digestive enzymes if it starts to back up and bulge here then it will start leaking into blood vessels around the pancreas and we start getting amylase and lipase in our bloodstream we shouldn't have a large amount of amylase and lipase um, but if our amounts start to increase that is a sign that there is obstruction in the pancreas um, so we will watch amylase and lipase are our key um, labs to watch, and they actually are digestive enzymes. So you can imagine we do not want digestive enzymes circulating around in our blood. So if we have amylase lipase in our blood, that means that we actually have actual digestive enzymes circulating around in our bloodstream where they should not be. Um, so any increased amylase lipase is going to tell us that something is wrong in our pancreas. Uh, we all know about um, diabetes. Hopefully you covered diabetes already. Um, the other job of the pancreas is to make insulin and glucagon, um, and, they can, and it can control um, blood sugar. So we do talk about at the very end of this lecture some out-of-control blood sugar issues, which you may have had already. Um, it may be review, but I am going to just reiterate it this class to make sure. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is acute pancreatitis. This is where your pancreas was functioning happily and healthily, and now it is not. Um, the pain is going to be in your left upper quadrant. So the liver sits in the right upper quadrant, and the gallbladder sits in the right upper quadrant. The pancreas kind of sits off to the side from it. Um, if we look back in our picture here, you could kind of see that um, this would be up here. This right here is where our liver is and our gallbladder. So you can see the pancreas extends all the way to underneath the stomach. So it's going to move off to the left side. So this is the right side and this is the left side of our abdomen. So the pancreas will be um, felt in the left upper quadrant. Um, it hurts quite a bit. It is being self-digested, so it's going to scream out in pain. Uh, the pain is radiating to the back, and the pain is aggravated by eating. 
This is a great tool to tell you whether your pancreas is working well or not. If you eat anything, and remember this pancreatic enzyme secretion is stimulated by eating. Um, so as soon as you put something in your mouth, you will stimulate these pancreatic enzymes. And um, that will, of course, if they can't get out and you're auto-digesting, making more enzymes is going to make this worse. So anytime you eat, the left upper quadrant pain gets worse, could be a sign of pancreatitis. Nausea, vomiting, um, low-grade fever due to inflammation and auto-digestion, high white blood cell count because, again, there's a lot of debris to clean up there. No infection just yet. Um, this is due to, it's, it's an irritation, inflammation, and itis, but it's not due to a bacteria at this point. It's due to auto-digestion. But then once we have bleeding and things, we can get bacteria. It is right next to the intestine. Um, you can get bacteria translocating into it very easily. Um, high white blood cell count will be from the auto-digestion process, but also it could be bacterial as well. High amylase lipase levels is our key labs to look at with pancreatitis and hypocalcemia. And I could discuss the pathophysiology behind it, but it's really complex. I tried to look it up and it's very hard to explain why. Just know, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to know that hypocalcemia does go with pancreatitis. Um, Worsening cues is the pancreas auto digests itself to the point that it ruptures and starts to bleed. Um, so we are going to be looking for signs of bleeding, which is Turner's and Cullen's sign. Again, those are signs of any kind of abdominal bleeding in our pancreas and in our abdomen. So if we are bleeding from our pancreas, it will show up in our abdomen. Um, pancreatic abscesses, um, this is where the white blood cells are trying to clean things up, can abscess off kind of necrotizing or dying parts of our pancreas. Um, and um, if we get bacteria across into the pancreas and some of those abscesses burst, um, we could get an infection in our parot our abdominal space, which is peritonitis. And like any kind of intestinal um, rupture, um, a pancreatic abscess rupture is going to cause um, infection as well into our abdominal space, and that's going to be a high fever, a firm, rigid abdomen, and pain in all four quadrants now, not just the left upper quadrant. Um, because this is sitting, the pancreas is sitting up underneath, um, so when we draw our, let me go back to look at our little picture here, if we look at um, where everything sits, this is the liver and the gallbladder there. Um, our diaphragm sits right above this. So remember, we had our little hiatus area where the esophagus goes through. And so we have a diaphragm. So when the pancreas starts to bleed or get infected, um, it can really affect because it's up there close to the diaphragm. Um, and actually, the kidney really kind of sits over all of this. The kid I mean, not the kidney, the liver. The liver is kind of big. Um, it kind of sits over all this. Um, the pancreas is sitting underneath it. But anyway, because of the proximity of these toxins and these digestive enzymes, um, if this ruptures, not only do we have probably abdominal pain, some of this rupture can eat through. And again, these are digestive enzymes. So if they rupture, they can leak up through the diaphragm and cause pulmonary edema. So severe, severe uh, pancreatitis uh, can have pulmonary edema and digestive enzymes near the lungs is not a good thing. Um, you get a lot of um, immune response to the lungs causing pulmonary edema and ARDS. So what are we going to look for? Well, definitely pain, quality, location. Remember, it's going to be in the left upper quadrant. Um, if it starts moving around to more quadrants or up into the diaphragm or um, starting to irritate that area, we want to be concerned if you see any bleeding. Um, if you're going to be watching the temperature, it should be low grade. But if the temperature becomes high grade or a high fever, then we might have some bacterial involvement and some sepsis. Um, we're going to be watching our blood pressure for any kind of drop in blood pressure for bleeding. Our glucose, because as the pancreas becomes damaged, auto-digesting itself with its digestive enzymes, then it is not able to make insulin as well. So a normally functioning pancreas, these um, patients probably do not have diabetes, but if we are swollen so bad that our pancreas kind of looks like the red guy in the picture here. Um, this pancreas is not making insulin to the best of its ability. So you may start seeing hyperglycemia um, because it's not making effective amounts of um, 
insulin anymore. Amylase lipase levels, because again, as we have auto digestion, we still have digestive enzymes being made if you're still eating, and those will climb up in the bloodstream. Um, white blood cell count will tell you whether there is basically pancreatitis. The first signs is pain and increased white blood cell count. Um, and then as damage progresses, things get worse. And then the calcium levels, because hypocalcemia is associated with pancreatitis. What are we going to do? The first thing we're going to do is just stop pancreatic stimulation because the pancreas needs to stop auto-digesting itself. And the only way to slow down pancreatic enzyme secretion is to stop eating. So the first thing after pancreatitis is diagnosed or suspected is NPO. I mean NPO, not ice chips, nothing. Because if we put ice in our mouth, guess what we're going to stimulate? If we put anything in our mouth and get salivation going, you've also increased your pancreatic enzyme secretion. So strict, strict NPO, not just, oh, a couple of sips or some ice chips, nothing. Nothing in the mouth, nothing to stimulate pancreatic secretion. Um, they will get NG tube suction, which will help relieve any pressure down there from swelling um, in the pancreas. Um, it will also prevent any kind of pancreatic enzyme secretion happening from the stomach. So we basically are going to keep your mouth um, from stimulating pancreatic secretions, and we're going to keep your stomach from stimulating pancreatic secretions. So NPO and NG tube. Um, they, if you still need to be feeding, if this is going to be a long-term problem, they will feed you post-pyloric, which is below, um, below the, in the duodenum past any kind of stimulation point. So they will actually put a feeding tube, not in the gastric area, because that will stimulate past uh, pancreatic secretions. They will put um, tube feedings in the lower, um, or down in the jejunum, the lower duodenum jejunum, past the entry point of the pancreatic enzyme, so nothing gets stimulated. Um, and then definitely, you know, if it's going to be a couple of days um, or two or, you know, more than three or four days that we're going to be treating pancreatitis, um, then they will probably have some kind of alternate feeding placed. Um, pain relief. Hopefully the pain will subside a bit if we do not stimulate the pancreas, but um, it's usually narcotic or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because this is an anti-inflammatory, this is an inflammatory process going on. Um, aggressive IV hydration, tons and tons of fluid to flush that amylase and lipase out of our bloodstream. Antibiotics to fight any kind of bacteria that are translocating into the uh, pancreas for, due to the swelling. Um, and getting rid of whatever is causing the obstruction in the first place. So most commonly is this ERCP procedure, which is the two pictures on the side here. And this right here is an endoscope. So remember we said the endoscope has amazing um, functions on it. So not only is it a camera, it's almost like a little, little um, it can deploy a um, snare and it can go up in there and um, basically they'll push it past any obstruction, blow up a balloon past the obstruction, and then yank it back down and pull that, that obstruction with it. So they basically could try to clear... Um, uh, any kind of gallstones or any problems like that, they can try and do it through the endoscope, which of course is just light sedation. Um, you're getting a tube down your throat. It's not as painful as um, having open surgery. But if they can't clear it with ERCP or it's not due to just a stone in the duct that they can do quickly, um, they may need to do open surgery. Um, if there are too many stones and the inflammation is too much, that if they pop that stone out now, it's still inflamed and it's still going to be blocked um, they may have to go in and do um, abdominal surgery. Um, and if they're going to go in there and remove your gallbladder as well, they may just go in and um, do the removal of the stone with the removal of the gallbladder. But usually least invasive to most invasive, they will try the ERCP or the endoscope or the endoscopy um, retrograde. It's a big fancy word. Coleangiopancreatography. I can't say it, but cole means gallbladder. And pancreas means pancreas, so they're going in and looking at the um, pancreas and the gallbladder with the scope and then doing interventions if they need to. So ERCP is our least invasive intervention, and then if you need it, you can have surgery. Um, 
basically let patients know the causes of pancreatitis so they don't get it again. Hopefully, if it is gallstones that have blocked the pancreatic duct, they hopefully have removed the gallbladder as well because worsening conditions of gallstones will get surgery to remove the gallbladder or so that hopefully their gallbladder is gone and that shouldn't be a problem anymore. But um, cirrhosis and alcoholic damage, you can have um, acute pancreatitis just due to alcoholism. Um, the alcohol uh, that circulates in our bloodstream does destroy the pancreas. Um, alcohol is a toxin as well. So um, our second most common cause after the gallstones is actual just alcoholic damage. Um, and then there are some other causes as well. But patients with acute pancreatitis should be on a low-fat diet as well, a low-carb diet, because basically we're not creating as many while you're having pancreatitis. We're not creating as many digestive enzymes. So once they are started up on a diet again, um, you know, the damaged pancreatitis may, re you know, the damaged pancreas may return, may regenerate, may not. So not stressing it out with high fats or high carb diet will be helpful. And then if you are a smoker or a drinker, um, both term, both smoking and alcohol use long term can cause chronic pancreatitis especially after you have a damaging episode. The pancreas does not rejuvenate itself as well as the liver does. Um, it will rejuvenate itself, but not as well as the liver. The liver is miraculous in its rejuvenation. The pancreas does take a hit, and it just stays kind of damaged. Um, so anyway, uh, smoking and alcohol cessation is really, really important after a damaging episode of pancreatitis because you're at much more risk for more pancreatic damage, and then chronic pancreatitis. So let's talk about chronic pancreatitis. And this is basically kind of cirrhosis or um, scarring of the pancreas. Um, this happens usually, the most common cause is, um, is alcoholism that causes um, this, this pancreatic scarring. Um, how do we know the difference between chronic pancreatitis and acute pancreatitis? Well, there is abdominal pain, and it's still in the left upper quadrant because that's where our pancreas sits, but it's more of a heavy gnawing aching that is there all the time and not associated with eating. And the problem is, is our pancreas, and you can see down there, is really not that, um, not that productive anymore. Not as many digestive enzymes are being made, probably not as much insulin is being made, and so it's a dull, constant pain, um, but not associated with eating. Um, constipation, because basically when we have chronic pancreatitis, um, we have a decreased, uh, its main job is to make pancreatic enzymes that are aid in digestion. So without the digestive enzymes being made, um, food does not get broken up as well. You're at increased risk of constipation and increased risk of fatty stools. Um, so when your stools do pass, they are fatty, um, and that's just due to obstruction. You can also see here, knowing the anatomy of this area now, that if we still have our gallbladder and our liver, that you can see that swelling in here Swelling in here is causing obstruction to bile exit. So bile can't, it's not bile X, it's just bile cannot get out. Bile is stuck up in the liver. And okay, maybe it fills the gallbladder, but now the gallbladder can't dump. Um, these swollen and um, obstructed pancreatic organs can cause liver damage. Um, because bile is getting stuck up in the liver and causing liver damage as well. Um, so bile is our last, you know, our last digestive enzyme that's being produced. So we have decreased enzymes being produced um, by the pancreas, and then we might have decreased bile. And maybe if our liver is functioning, not decreased bile production, but decreased bile ex um, to the intestines. because we don't have, because all this area is swollen and scarred. And so now there's no real pancreatic, there's no real digestive enzymes getting down to that duodenal area. Um, as that pancreas loses function, it loses the ability to make insulin and um, you end up 
with diabetes, even if you weren't prone to diabetes anyway. Um, there aren't really any worsening cues except that the more cirrhotic your pancreas is, or sorry, the more um, scarred up your pancreas is, the higher you have a risk of pancreatic cancer. Um, so just keep an eye and quantify the lower upper, uh, sorry, the left upper quadrant abdominal pain. Um, keep an eye on the nutrition status and the blood glucose because that's really going to tell us if we're making digestive enzymes or not. Um, the treatment for chronic pancreatitis is just to replace its functions the best of their ability, and that is to give pancreatic enzymes. Um, a lot of teaching involved with pancreatic enzymes, you need to take them appropriately or they don't work. Um, you have to take the enzymes with every meal or snack in the first mouthful of food. Otherwise, you've just shoveled things in that are going to pass straight through. Without the digestive enzymes, I mean, you will break up some in the stomach, but these digestive enzymes are there to continue breaking up food in the intestine, and they're put in at the beginning of the intestine so they can work throughout the intestine. Um, we need to put them in to our mouth and our food with the first meal so they can travel with the food um, through, the, um, through the intestines the way they're supposed to. Um, they should be taken with the first mouthful of food. Um, they are coated to survive the trip through the stomach. Um, you cannot uh, crush them um, or chew them because they are specially coated to, per to survive the, um, the acid of the stomach or they're specially coated so that the acid of the stomach dissolves the coating but not the enzymes because the acid in the stomach will denature the enzymes and make them useless if um, they are damaged before they're supposed to be damaged. So the coating around these enzymes is designed to dissolve in the stomach. And so you're supposed to take them at the beginning of every meal, the coating dissolves in the stomach, and then the enzymes are available as the food gets dumped into the intestine. Um, so take the foods as directed, but make sure that um, the enzymes can also be damaged by high temperatures. So don't drink them with the morning coffee if it's hot. Don't drink them with morning tea. Um, don't, don't drink them with hot water as well. So don't drink them with hot drinks. Don't crush or chew them. They have a specially designed coating, and it's there for a reason. Um, it's also easier if we're supplying, you know, if we're supplying pancreatic enzymes, that's for a, an ideal diet. We're not providing enough pancreatic enzymes to deal with a high fat, high carb diet. So low diet, um, low food, small frequent meals taken with their enzymes is much more easy to digest. Um, they may need to go on insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents, um, or oral glycemic. It should just be glycemic agents. Don't worry. It's not hypoglycemic. Um, things like the, um, just oral glycemic agents. Um, but they'll might need to go on because now they're going to be diabetic. They're not, they don't have an autoimmune disease. They've lost their pancreas. Um, just let them know. At this point, if you have done enough alcohol that you've destroyed your pancreas um, or you're a smoker or both um, and you've destroyed your pancreas, not only have you now lost your pancreas, but you might as well stop because you're at very, very high risk of pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is not very treatable. Um, so avoid alcohol and, alcohol and smoking if you haven't already. Eat smaller meals more often. Drink a lot of fluid to flush things through. Keep you from getting constipated. And make sure you are taking uh, your digestive enzymes uh, as directed. Um, and then, of course, the worsening damage, any worsening cues of any liver damage if it wasn't there already. A lot of these patients have cirrhosis already. Um, so we're not, we're going to be teaching them to take care of their liver with, you know, cirrhosis, um, teaching as well. But if they do not have cirrhosis and they have chronic pancreatitis, um, then to keep an eye out for worsening liver disease. So that is pancreatitis in a nutshell, acute and chronic. Um, this is just a review. You should have hypoglycemia down. If you do not, though, a couple of slides on hypoglycemia and to make sure you understand how to treat hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is usually anything less than 70. 70 is um, the sugar that we want them at. 70 to 100 is your goal. Anything over 70, though, anything under 70 is considered hypoglycemia. Um, if they're conscious, 
and able to eat. Um, give them a simple carb, fruit juice, soda, something that is digested quickly to get their sugar under control. If they are unconscious, unable to eat, have a swallowing disorder or NPO, you could do glucose gel, um, IV glucose, or IM glucagon. There's a couple of different things that you can give to get your sugar up if you can't eat. The important thing, though, is to give something quick-acting and then give something long-acting. And you keep checking the sugar every 15 minutes until it's greater than 70. Um, if it is not greater than 70 in your first 15-minute check, then you're going to redo the fast food again. Um, so basically keep checking it. Keep giving fast carbohydrates until you're over 70. And then once you're over 70, give them either that complex carbohydrate, something like peanut butter or... Um, complex foods, a sandwich. Um, and then if they are not eating, make sure that they have enough dextrose in their IV fluids if they're not eating. Um, so that is hypoglycemia. We're going to just talk really quick about DKA. I don't know if you had this in block two. It's on my curriculum to discuss. So I did want to just tell you a story of DKA. Um, What's happening in diabetic ketoacidosis is um, a combination, and I'm going to tell you the story of a blood vessel and some cells. Um, so let's draw our little blood vessel here. So we have our blood vessel, and we have cells outside the blood vessel. So here are our lovely, beautiful little cells. Now, when we have um, type 1 or insulin-dependent type 2, this is meaning we do not make enough insulin. Um, glucose starts to build up in here. And the only way into the cells is with insulin. We need insulin to get the glucose into the cells. So you eat your starch or your carbs or whatever, and you make sugar, and you have glucose in your bloodstream, and the only way to get that into the cells is with insulin. So we're telling a story of... Um, a blood cell or a blood vessel with a ton of glucose in it and no insulin. So this is what's happening, and this happens in um, undiagnosed diabetics. This is usually their first diagnosis. And so we have a ton of insulin, and we have these cells. And they say, we're hungry. They're hungry. They want glucose. They want their sugar, but there's no insulin to give it to them. And then to add insult to injury, these poor little hungry cells that are sad, guess what's getting stolen from them? Think about this glucose circulating around in the bloodstream. Glucose makes the bloodstream super thick. So what is attracted out of these cells is water. They're losing water. So now we're hungry and we're thirsty. There's nothing these cells can do to keep water in them. The water is attracted to this big, thick, hypertonic environment. So now we have our poor little cells. Are, they're hungry and they're thirsty and they're shriveled. We're hungry. We're thirsty. Help us. So they're sending out this message to the brain and out to the body, and the bloodstream is becoming full of water, and it remains full of glucose because there's no insulin. So guess who comes in to save the day over on the other end of the planet here, of our planet body, is we have our friend that we learned about in another lecture. We have our friend, the liver. And he says, I can save the day. And how does he save the day? How can the liver save the day? The liver goes, I got you. I got you, man. I'm going to make the fats that we have turn in to glucose. Yay! I'm turning fats into glucose, and I'm putting glucose into the bloodstream for you. There you go, cells. Have some glucose. 
So the liver keeps making glucose. Unfortunately, the byproduct of that is ketones, and those actually go into the bloodstream too. So here we go, and is this helping? The glucose level is going up in the bloodstream because the liver keeps making it, and they keep yelling, we're hungry. It's getting louder and louder. We're hungry. We're hungry. Are they getting any of this glucose? They are not getting any of this glucose because there's no insulin to put glucose in the cells. So they're still screaming, we're hungry. And the liver's still screaming, I still got you. But if I am, I got you. I got you. I'm going to make some more glucose. There you go. Have more have more. And they're like, we're still hungry. Again, we're still hungry. And the liver's like, I still got you, man. Here, have some more glucose. And so the whole system gets overrun with glucose. The ketones are starting to accumulate big too, because that's what's happening as the liver's saying, I got you. The ketones are going up because that is what happens when you turn fat, when you turn glucose from fat. So the moral of the story, and then what is happening to the fluid, the bloodstream is getting super concentrated. And so now more and more fluid until these cells are completely shriveled and they're just constantly screaming, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're hungry, we're thirsty. So you drink, you drink, and the water stays in the bloodstream. So... Now that I've drawn that very highly dramatic story all over your slide, let's clear it. And let's like take a look. So this is why we have our glucose greater than 300 is because the liver is making a ton of glucose and they keep going. You already started off with high glucose. It started the whole problem. The cells said, we're hungry. The liver said, I got you. I'm making you some glucose. And the glucose just keeps going up and up and up. The kidney's like, I don't even know what's going on on that side of town. There's some crazy crap going on. But all I know is I've got a lot of, I've got so much glucose. Let me spill some of this. Dude, we don't even need all this glucose. There is some serious miscommunication going on in the bloodstream. But I'm going to spill glucose because we don't need all this much. And it's like, what are these ketones doing here? These are acidic. We've got to get rid of these. Um, so remember, these are um, acidic and the glucose is hypertonic. So the kidneys, like, kidneys dumping this stuff um, because the kidneys, like, I don't know what's going on, but um, let's get it out of here. Now, the kidney can only do so much, so the we keep acidic ketones in our body, but um, it's trying to get dumped out by the kidney. So we start seeing ketones and glucose in our urine because the kidney's doing its job and getting rid of it. Um, we end up starting to get acidotic because of these ketones, okay? These ketones are building up because the liver is just going, I got you, I got you, and making more ketones and more glucose. Um, so now we are becoming acidotic. So we're becoming acidotic from no fault of our own, just from a faulty communication cycle going on here. Um, so now because of these acidic ketones, our pH is dropping. Um, our bicarb is going to try to buffer some of this acid. So we start losing bicarb. Um, it's lost um, buffering. And so basically the bicarb combines with some of these acidic things to make it neutralized. Um, but it's lost buffering. So we use it all up basically as fast as we can make it. So we get metabolically acidotic and um, what we're getting in response, this is compensation. So if we have a lot of acid in our bloodstream, the body can exhale the ketones and it can also exhale acidic CO2. So it will get rid of some extra CO2. So the it's like, okay, I can help out. So the kidney's trying to help out and the respiratory system's trying to help out. The kidney's retaining bicarb and dumping acidics as fast as it can. Um, and the respiratory system's like, look, I can, I can come and help out too. Let me, I can breathe out some of these acidic ketones and I'll throw in some extra acidic CO2 trying to compensate. So these Kussmaul respirations is deep, deep inhales and exhales. So, <sighs> 
The reason they're doing that is to get rid of acids. It's not problematic in itself. It is just trying to compensate. The, when you exhale, it smells sweet and fruity, and that is the smell of ketones. The sweet smell, ketones smell sweet. Your, sugar, your, um, your urine's going to smell sweet too. Ketones are um, a sweet-smelling um, odiferous compound, I guess. Um, so anyway, you're going to be breathing out this sweet, fruity breath odor. almost smells like, you know, kind of like sickly sweet of a smell. The urine smells that as well because ketones are being dumped into the urine. So we've got our compensation systems trying to work. The kidneys dumping stuff, the respiratory systems trying to dump out acids, you end up severely dehydrated, not bloodstream dehydrated, cell dehydration. So this is cellular. Remember, those little cells are thirsty because they are losing, they're losing volume into, if we draw our little picture again, sorry, I just love to draw. Not good at it, but I love it. Um, water is going into the system because we have so much glucose. So again, the kidneys start seeing all this increased water. And it's like, what are we doing with all this fluid? I don't need it. Starts dumping it out. So the high osmolality or the thickness of the blood pulls fluid from the tissues causing during diuresis. The tissues are losing cells. The cells are dehydrated. But there's diuresis because the kidney doesn't know that. The kidney's like, well, I just see a ton of fluid. I'm going to get rid of it. So you start peeing out all this extra fluid and you're thirsty because the cells are screaming at you. We're thirsty. We're thirsty. So you drink water. You drink and drink and drink all the time, but you're never satiated because the water never sees the cells. Um, hypokalemia because the, the potassium is getting diluted. Um, the worsening cues is leaving the body in this crisis system causes acidosis. And remember, our body cells can't live acidotic. So um, they're going to become sick and stop functioning. So metabolic acidosis and severe dehydration can cause multiple organ failure. And that is the tragedy of DKA, um, is basically massive, massive acidosis. And it's all caused by the liver really trying to help out but unfortunately, those ketones made by the liver cause a lot more problems to the body. So we're going to monitor the glucose level because we know it's going to be high. And we can see it getting higher because the, kid, the liver is making more. Level of consciousness is telling us whether the acidosis is affecting our brain functioning or not. Cardiac rhythm, acidosis affects our brain functioning. Um, hydration, mucous membranes, you can bet those are dry as a bone. You have a dry, dry mucous membranes and a ton of urine output. It doesn't make sense. And we're seeing a metabolic acidosis. Um, they don't need to keep sticking you for an ABG. They will trend this acidosis with those CO2 and chloride levels that we kind of discussed in the electrolyte lecture. Remember, they are inverse proportions to um, CO2 level when it's low, you are acidotic, and the chloride level um, is hot. Gosh, I can't even remember which one. They use them to trend um, metabolic acidosis. And we will follow the electrolytes, especially potassium, because once we start treating this, um, we are going to have problems with our potassium. So what do you think we do to stop this cycle from happening? All right. We're going to be giving insulin. It was the cause of the problem in the first place. The big problem was there was so much glucose circulating around, but none of it could get into the cells because there was no insulin. And that's why the cells started screaming and complaining to the liver, and the liver started making more glucose. So we have to get that glucose to the cells to stop this process. So what we're going to do is we're going to add insulin to the system, and now that is going to slowly, over time, fix our problem. We're going to get that glucose moving into the cells where it belongs so they stop asking for food. We need to feed them, and we need insulin to feed them. Insulin is the only thing that opens that channel to allow glucose in. So now they can say, we're full. And then the liver says, 
finally. And it stops producing no more ketones because it's not making sugar anymore. Thank goodness. We're good. Thank you. We're happy now. We are good, happy cells. And that's all due to getting insulin. So it stops the ketosis and stops the worsening of acidosis. We need insulin. The only problem with it, and they're going to be on this insulin until the acidosis, till that ketone level drops and the acidosis goes away. Then we can maybe, they'll be on that continuous insulin. Um, they will constantly need um, the insulin because we don't want this whole process resetting. If you take them off insulin too quick, the whole thing starts again. Glucose starts building up. The cells become unhappy. They start complaining to the liver, and the liver starts making glucose again, and it starts all over. So continuous insulin until the acidosis resolves. And those, we're going to keep those cells happy by giving them insulin and helping that glucose leave the cells. And you will watch the glucose level in the blood drop and drop and drop and drop um, until it reaches about 250. And then once it's at 250, um, we don't want things to become hypoglycemic. We start adding dextrose to our IV fluids afterwards. Because remember, this whole, they're super dehydrated, right? These cells, we want to get glucose in there and we also want to return water to the cells. So we want to put something in there that is going to push water into the cells. And so that would be a hypotonic solution or an isotonic solution. Either one, a hypotonic will aggressively rehydrate those cells and they won't yell out we're thirsty anymore. A normal saline will also, it will, as the glucose goes in there, um, then water will kind of go in there too. Either one is a perfectly appropriate for rehydrating. So they need the insulin. They need fluids because that was the problem with the cells. They were hungry. They were dehydrated. So let's feed them with the insulin, get that glucose to go in, and then we'll give them water. We can give them hypotonic or isotonic. Either one will give them water, and everybody is happy. The only one that is not happy is that insulin takes potassium with it into the cell. So we might end up getting hypokalemic in our bloodstream because insulin also allows potassium into the cells. So that's fine, but it leaves the bloodstream for a while and they look hypokalemic. And we don't want that to affect the heart, so we may have to um, give them some potassium as well. The mainstay is um, that we want to feed the cells by opening the door to glucose, and we want to hydrate the cells. So there's plenty of glucose in the system. The glucose level is over 300. There's plenty of glucose to feed. We just need the channel to be opened. So the regular insulin drip will open the channels, and then IV fluids will hydrate them. And that will fix the problem. The acidosis will clear. Depends on how bad your acidosis was when you come in for treatment. Sometimes it could take 12 to 24 hours to really clear up the acidosis. Um, so we're going to do regular IV insulin. That's the only insulin that you can give IV. You can't give NPH, Lispro, Humalog, any of those things. Only regular human insulin can be given IV and it is in the form of a continuous drip. There's also, we, um, there's a lot of protocols around how much to give insulin-wise. The physician usually orders a starting dose of insulin, and it's usually like 0.1 units per kilo. So if you weigh 80 kilos, it would be like eight units an hour. If you weigh 100 kilos, it could be 10 units an hour. Um, what we're doing, though, is we're watching hourly blood glucoses and adjusting that drip as needed hourly, according to physician orders. They usually have a titration um, algorithm, which means that we can change the drip based on glucose levels. We don't want the glucose dropping too fast because that means that we've... Um, we could cause fluid shifting by just the glucose levels dropping in this. The, if the blood is not thick anymore, then fluid flushes across into the cells and can cause bursting. So we certainly don't want to change the glucose level too fast. We want to do this in a slow, gradual process. So the important thing is remember continuous IV, not just 10 units push 
it's a continuous IV drip. So they're getting 10 units over an hour. It's going to be a slow IV drip. It's going to be probably running at 10 milliliters an hour to give that 10 units slowly over the hour. We don't want to just, you know, push 10 units right away um, and then do it again in an hour. We want this as a continuous infusion of insulin. So insulin will fix, will stop the acidosis and rehydration with IV fluids. Hopefully that makes you understand a little bit more the diabetic ketoacidosis problem. Um, this is usually undiagnosed, untreated diabetes. Um, this is usually the first episode is some kind of DKA episode that sends them in and then they um, end up getting, um, getting diagnosed with diabetes. Um, any type 1 or insulin-dependent type 2 diabetic that has illness or infection and increasing their, um, their metabolic needs and um, if you are decreased or missing doses of insulin or can't afford your insulin anymore and stop taking it, you can end up in DKA. Um, really the big teaching point is um, the diabetic diet and that if you are sick or ill um, to make sure that you don't stop eating. Um, keep eating even though um, and when you're ill, just keep a double eye on your glucose level. Um, when you're ill and don't forget to eat, um, but don't forget to take your insulin either. So a lot of people don't feel well and they're like, well, I'm not eating, so I'm not going to take my insulin and they end up diabetic ketoacidosis. So there's a lot of teaching on how to manage um, so they don't go into another DKA episode. Um, and then the last one we're going to talk about is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, which is kind of the crisis or the worsening condition of type 2 diabetes. So you can go into DKA if you have type 1 or insulin-dependent type 2. These are oral or diet-controlled type 2 diabetics get HHS. And the reason being they have enough insulin to avoid ketosis. So what happens is... Um, you have enough insulin that, so let's draw our little, our little cell drama again. Um, we have our thing. We have a ton of glucose for whatever reason. Um, but our cells are not hungry because we have enough insulin to keep them fed. So they're not hungry. We're not hungry. So they're happy, except for the fact that this increased glucose level from whatever cause, they have enough insulin to keep them happy. So the liver never gets called in. So the liver's not making its ketone things. There's no liver involvement. Because there's no complaining from the cells. So there's no liver involvement. So there's no ketones. Um... These cells are super happy except for one thing. What is a thick, thick bloodstream going to pull from them? It's going to pull water. So they are thirsty. Whoops. Ah! Oh, my drawing. It went away. Oh, how sad. They end up getting thirsty. Hopefully you found the drawing or you can go back and go back and look at it. Um... The glucose levels climb and climb and climb. There's less symptoms, no thing to tell you they're wrong. The cells don't start screaming. You don't start getting acidotic. There's no signs and symptoms. But you do get super, super dehydrated because the higher the glucose climbs, the more dehydrated you get. So they get high, um, they get high, they get polyuria because they're pulling everything from the cells until the cells get so dry that they can't give anymore. And then you start completely drying up because now you just have thick stuff circulating around with no water to pull from. And when we're talking about severe dehydration, we're talking about severe dehydration of your brain, of your lung cells, of your kidney cells, of your liver cells. Like all the cells have been sapped dry um, and they've peed it all out and the kidneys are like, oops, maybe we shouldn't have done that. I didn't know what was going on. They're super, super high glucose. They have polyuria until the cells have given up all of their fluid, and now they are completely dehydrated, a low blood pressure due to dehydration, extreme lethargy because the brain is completely dehydrated, confusion, dry mucous membranes. Yes, they are spilling glucose into their urine, but they have no ketones, 
no metabolic acidosis. So the severe problem here is dehydration. So what are we going to do to treat it? Um, we are going to treat this with IV fluids first, and then we're going to do insulin because the glucose levels on here have climbed. This has been undetected for weeks and months, and this is usually seen in older people who maybe don't have a good thirst drive anyway and have just allowed themselves to get super, super, super dehydrated until they're confused. Um, this usually happens, like I said, in the elderly population. Um, a lot of times in nursing homes where if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so they just, they don't have a thirst drive and they're just getting sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter, but you have no cues or signs or symptoms until you are completely dehydrated. So we're going to rehydrate them first. More fluids needed than DKA, but we're going to hydrate them. They will also get an insulin drip to help get rid of some of that glucose out of the system. Even though the cells aren't starving, they can take more. So um, we're going to give them an insulin drip, but it's not as big of a priority. It's to give until the glucose level goes down, but there's no acidosis. So we don't need to keep it on until the acidosis resolves because there's no acidosis. This is really symptom treatment. The insulin drip is just to get rid of, you know, let the body uptake the glucose. Um, hydration is the key with HHS. So HHS hydration and DKA needs insulin. They both need fluids and insulin, but they have different prioritizations. In DKA, we need insulin to stop the acidosis process, and we also need fluid to hydrate, but we need insulin first. In HHS, they need fluids first, and the insulin is a symptomatic treatment. There's no acidosis to stop. Um, and again, when you ever give a continuous insulin drip, um, insulin does shuttle potassium into cells, so we need to watch their potassium level. So I'll let you read the TJ. And this is important to teach these HHS patients to always drink and take their anti-diabetic agents, but also maintain hydration. And this is where maybe timed liquids would be good for an elderly patient without a thirst drive. Um, that's about it. I hope you understand some of these thoughts. Um, let me know if you have any questions.